well to everyone. This is this is quite like patting your head and rubbing your tummy at the same time, I have to say, for all of us. So please be, bear with us. This is a very exciting event for us, uh, us being Cumbria Arts and Culture Network. Um, my name is Stefan Eskreet. I'm vice chair of the steering group, and this is Kate Parry. Oh, I'm chair of the network. Um, and I'm staring at this webcam. And for those of you on Zoom, beyond the webcam is a, is a very lovely bunch of people who've made their way through the stormy weather to join us here at Braithay today. Um, so this is um, our quarterly meeting. Um, so yes, we have them three, four times a year, and they are a chance to explore subjects in greater depth beyond the Friday Zoom calls that we regularly have as part of the network. Um, Kate's going to say a little bit more about the, the thought behind the choice of subject matter in a wee while. Um, but today, it's very exciting to have a, a range of live contributors and people who are joining us on Zoom. Um, again, I just ask for your patience as we get used to this very exciting world of a blended meeting. A couple of things to say. Uh, the agenda. We're going to have um, three extraordinary women who are going to give keynote speeches to start us off. There will be an opportunity to ask them questions after their, each of their presentations. So if we can deal with questions for each individual keynote, when they finish their presentation. And then we're going to move on to presentations by people about case studies from Cumbria. Uh, and equally exciting, uh, we have uh, Andrew Mackay here and we have uh, Marie Mahan, who's here from uh, Common Purpose. They'll be giving case studies about specific examples of work that addresses the question that we're addressing today. And what is that question? That question is breaking down the barriers of success how do we drive up ambition and quality across the Cumbria culture sector? So that's what we're enjoying getting our brains wrapped around today in this session. Um, beyond the case studies and a break, we will then have the opportunity to uh, have discussion amongst ourselves in breakout groups. That's both in person, here in Braithe, we will be scurrying to different rooms as you on Zoom will be doing, hopefully. Thank you very much for doing that, where we'll have the opportunity to discuss things in smaller groups, share ideas, with the intention being, what can we do about this central question? What actions are out there? What can we do about it? And then we will rejoin as a whole group and share our observations about that. Um, and then we'll have a conclusion from Kath. Um, I should say, we're really grateful for the hospitality of Braithe. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lovely place. If you haven't had a chance to visit, Please, please try and do so in the future. They have actually been on the Friday call, the CACN call, uh, and told us a little bit about their offer, but it's a beautiful setting and a very inspiring setting for any creative activity. Um, alongside Braithe, we are here, I'm privileged to be here, and I'm surrounded by the cohort of students who are just coming to the conclusion of the Changing Culture Programme, uh, which we'll hear more about later on. Um, it's been running for two years. It's been an interesting collaboration between the University of Cumbria, Braithay Trust, and Theatre by the Lake. Um, etiquette. Um, the meeting is already being recorded. Um, alongside that, um, Tom Spate is going to be flitting around the live space taking pictures. So, all, everyone, do your hair now um, for the usual social media purposes. Um, the meeting is captioned, captioned on Zoom. Um, for those of you who would like to use that, I think that's, a, yes, I can see the words popping up on the screen there. Um, muting will be used um, on the Zoom call. Uh, for those of you uh, on Zoom, you may be able to see, yes, one of the panels is showing you the view of the room, and it's called Andrew Woodhead. <laughs> There's a very handsome gentleman over to my left. <laughs> And he has a camera trained on the room so that you can see what's happening in the live space as well as interacting with people who are joining the Zoom call. Um, behind us, there's a screen, a rather large screen where people in the live space can see your contributions on Zoom. Um, so we're hoping that we can keep the channels of communication open and free throughout the whole meeting. Please use chat and I'm sure people in here will be waving if, if you miss anything or there's any issue with following the, um, the agenda of the meeting. So, welcome, let's get underway. I'd like to hand over to Kate Parry. Thank you very much. Um, those of you in the room, could you please wave to the Zoomers? Just so that, oh, yeah, there we are. Does that work? 
<laughs> and despite the day, so that's going to be slightly hard. Anyway, uh, good morning, everybody in the room. Good morning, everybody on Zoom. It's great to be here. Um, for those of you who are not so familiar with Cumbria Arts and Culture Network, we exist to connect, champion, empower, and grow the culture sector in Cumbria. Um, it's exactly two years since we met in person. Weirdly, exactly, we were at the Cogate Centre in Cockermouth um, two years ago. Um, there was about 60 of us who had a great day. And we were there for the launch of the Arts Council's Let's Create Strategy. Little did we know that within weeks we would all be in lockdown. How could we possibly have imagined what the next two years was going to throw at us? But at that meeting, um, Tom and I stood up and said, how about um, we start to try this thing called Zoom? And we gave out leaflets and some of you took them away. And the very next week on Friday morning, we had our first Friday call and there were six of us. Tom and I were two of them. Uh, so there were four of the people. Uh, and so ever since then, ever since that Friday, <clears throat> you know, because a few weeks later, obviously, lockdown hit, we've carried on meeting. And so we've had 95 weekly calls since then on a Friday morning with over 4,000 attendances and 135 speakers. So, you know, the rest is history. Um, what an amazingly difficult two years it has been and how fitting it is that we're here again exactly two years later. And anyway, back to Let's Create, the Arts Council's 10-year strategy. Some of you will be very familiar with it. Some of you will not have ever heard of it. It is their 10-year strategy that was meant to run from 2020 to 2030. Um, it's based around three outcomes, which are around creative people. So everybody in the country having the, the rights and the ability to be creative in their own way for their own well-being. It's about cultural communities. So communities thriving as a result of cultural and creative activity. And it's about a creative and cultural uh, country, that's such a difficult thing to say, uh, which is about the sector as a whole being strong and thriving. It's also built around four investment principles, which again, some people here will be really familiar with and, 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 and you know, extremely familiar with. Others will never have heard of them before, and that's fine. <laughs> so the four investment principles are, Inclusivity and relevance, environmental responsibility, dynamism, and ambition and quality. So that's those are ways in which we are asked to work. It's not what we've got to do, it's the way that we work. And what has that got to do with us today? Well, we have decided that as a network, we will take each one of those investment principles for the theme of our quarterly meeting. Last time we talked about environmental responsibility. This time we are taking ambition and quality. But what, what has that got to do with us? Why are we talking about ambition and quality? Um, why does it matter? because there's so much good stuff already happening. And we see that very regularly on our Friday calls. Um, you know, the Changing Culture Programme itself is a smashing example of ambition and quality. So I'm not suggesting that there isn't good quality stuff out there. That's not what this is. This is about the, the ambition and quality investment principle, which asks us to look at what we mean by quality what you mean by quality in your work. It asks us to review what we do. It asks us to think about how we can constantly improve and get better. Um, it's about seeking feedback and learning from listening to feedback to get better at what we do. Specifically here today, we're looking at what gets in the way of ambition and quality in Cumbria. And that's what we're gonna be talking about in just a moment. So even without the Arts Council imperative, because you know, the, the network is not funded by the Arts Council, it matters because if you ever put an Arts Council application in, you will have to frame it around the four investment principles. So we hope that by having the conversation, it helps people do exactly that. Get your head around what they are. 
Personally, even without that Arts Council imperative, I think it behoves everybody for once in a while to stop and ask ourselves, what, do, what does quality look like in terms of what I do? How can we get better at it? How can we constantly be striving to do better? And what's getting in the way of success? So that's what we're we'll doing today. And I am going to now hand over with a little bit of camera jiggery. <laughs> Please bear with us whilst we do that. Two hazels. Debating with people and then shouting at them. So, right, that, that's much better, more friendly and uh, and more relaxed. So, right, okay, thanks, thanks very much. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here and um, amongst, I would say, um, friends, new friends that I've made and, and colleagues uh, in, in the last year or so. And um, just to be in a place that's full of beauty. Um, on a morning like this with a, a view out of the windows. I don't know what it does to you, but um, it does something really special to my sense of health and well-being and the big sky and um, the fact that there are people in this room um, who share that and who have a commitment to beauty and fineness. Um, and some of my remarks are going to be absolutely um, in that space. Um, so for you to have facilitated us through the network um, to come to a beautiful place to talk about the importance of quality and ambition and beauty and fineness, I think is something very special. Um, I've been asked if I would say a little bit about my own personal journey, not because I'm important, um, but <laughs> maybe because it just gives a little bit of context um, to, to why I've got involved with the, um, the network and, and various other arts activities across West Cumbria and places like that. Otherwise you'd think it was very strange. What's this woman doing here? I'm not an artist, um, and, um, but I've, I've got a huge love um, for the arts and for how it changes people's lives. Um, and for people who are um, able to have the amazing skills that they do right across the spectrum uh, of arts activities. Um, and it made me think um, a little bit about my growing up and um, my parents and my, my early upbringing. Uh, I'm from Salford originally, uh, the tough part of Salford, um, you know, two up, two down terraced houses, um, tin bath, um, outside toilet, the lot, you know, the, um, very ordinary working class background. Um, but actually I had extraordinary parents um, and you can never underestimate the impact that that has. Um, my mum and dad both left school at 14, but they had brilliant teachers. Um, and my mum in particular was um, a gifted artist. Um, she could paint, she could draw, um, she loved poetry, she loved literature. Um, and um, my, perhaps my dad less so, because he was a, a fitter in a factory, so he was more about making things, but that's as much about quality and ambition, making things, um, as, as if you like um, finer art. Um, so they, neither of them had a chance to go on to further education, although my mum uh, won a scholarship to the Royal College of Art um, for her drawing and painting. Um, her dad was away in the army. Um, her mum was basically a single parent. They didn't have any money. She couldn't go. Um, but she had that level of talent throughout her life. Um, and one of the things she did for me was she used to do my drawings for my homework. Um, <laughs> and I'll never forget, we had to do a picture of um, the, the progression of the wife of Bath. Um, uh, for Chaucer and my mum drew this wonderful procession with medieval uh, hangings on it and, and everything else and I handed it in for my homework and the teacher said to me Hazel tell your mum the horses are amazing <laughs> <laughs> there was no absolutely no hiding place um, but when she was um, 40 uh, she did for the first time she did a, a O level English literature um, and when she was 44 she did her A level um, and it was a bit like educating Rita she had a very uh, glamorous good looking tutor um, which which was a bonus to to her education but um, she always loved poetry um, she was surrounded by poetry um, and so I think having an example like that in your family of somebody you know who has no advantages really hard to get um, a step up was really influential for me um, and I told this story once before so please forgive me if you were in the same audience but um, my mum 
uh, wanted to take me to the ballet um, and she'd never really been to the ballet and certainly I had never been to the ballet. Uh, she saved up for about 12 months. Um, she, she did three jobs in order to keep us, you know, um, away from the poor house. Um, and she got the best um, seats on the front row of the circle in Manchester Opera House. And we went to see the Nutcracker. Um, and it was, for me, it was a life changing experience. I think I was about 11, 12. Um, and so to be in that company was um, just absolutely amazing. And we were literally, you know, you know, in the best seats. Um, and the thing I never forgot was um, at the interval, she she got us a box of Maltinas, Maltesers. Well, I'd never seen a box of Maltesers, you know, in my life before. So it, it was kind of, it was a magical experience. And from then on, I've had a lifelong love of dance and, and ballet. Um, and now I'm talking to Tom earlier on, uh, I'm a silver swan in Grange. Um, and we have silver swan ballet dancing lessons for ladies of uh, mature years, <laughs> shall we say. And uh, ranging from 60 to, um, I think our oldest lady is 85. Um, and it is absolutely magical um, on a Wednesday, uh, Wednesday morning, probably about 30 of us. And um, so that lifelong love of ballet has probably in influenced a lot of my work that I've tried to do around cultural experiences. My first political post was um, as the chair of cultural services on Salford City Council, um, surrounded by basically again 50 odd men, all with an engineering background saying what is Hazel talking about, <laughs> etc, etc. Um, but we did have a great collection of Lowry paintings in Salford Art Gallery. Um, and again, there was um, a quality and fineness and ambition around the early leaders um, of, our, of our city who had actually been prepared to go out and invest and bring the Lowry paintings and make the art gallery, which even if you go now is an amazing place. It has a Victorian street in the basement. Um, it is children come in there hundreds to visit um, and, and, and see everything. So um, that was a big influence for me. Um, and then the next bit of, of my own experience was um, when I became the Member of Parliament for Salford. Um, representing your hometown as a working class girl is like an amazing place to be. And um, I was lucky enough to be able to influence the um, establishment of the Lowry Centre um, uh, in, in Salford Keys and bringing Media City um, in, into Salford as well. And again, there was a lot of scepticism um, from, from people, you know, who were, were quite nervous. Are we, are, we, are we kind of having gentrification? Are we bringing all these outsiders in? Um, you know, the, the, they don't value the skills that we have, the industrial skills, and the making skills and all of that. Um, but actually, uh, because of the way it was managed, the Lowry Centre, I mean, I was worried that it would just become the place for posh people from Bramall to come and watch the ballet on a Saturday night and they could afford £30 tickets. How are we going to get local people to come in? Um, because where it was, at, you know, where it is, is Oddsall. Now, Oddsall is the toughest place uh, in Salford, you know, it's got a lot of serious and organised crime gangs. Um, kids find it very difficult to stay on the straight and narrow. Um, you know, the, the family breakdown is enormous. So, you know, cheap by jowl with that, you bring this amazing glittering palace in. Managing that transition, I think, was a real challenge for us. And the way in which we did it was every single touring company that came to the Lowry Centre had in their contract a, a, an enforceable commitment to working in the community, you know, opera in the pubs, getting into the, the toughest places, bringing people into the Lowry so that they could see it for themselves and they could experience the fineness and the quality and the ambition. You know, a lot of people um, in working class communities say, well, you know, it's not for us because they don't know how to access it. You bring the children in and they then bring the parents in and you've got a way of actually explaining um, and, and giving people an enrichment of their own experience to do that. And um, the best example we did uh, was we got um, some of the lads from Oddsall who were on the cusp of you know, going wrong, if you like, um, but they were, um, tall and well not that tall because no sulfur people are that tall but they weren't that tall but they were muscular and they were strong um, and they had you know great bodies and, and we brought them in for a whole summer of ballet um, led by you know um, ballet dancers who are muscular and strong and amazing and using their bodies to express their feelings and they came uh, and, and they came back you know we thought they'll come once and they'll never come back and they came back and then they performed. And it was things like that that made the community really feel this is for us. And you have to keep that going constantly. You can always veer off <clears throat> to it being something else, but keeping that going is what now has made it. The people of Salford would fight to keep the Lowry Centre now because it's theirs. They feel a sense of ownership. They want to be there. So that for me was really, really uh, important. 
the best bit was when I had to get the train home from London, um, coming back from Parliament, and there was the, ta uh, the ballet critic from the Times newspaper on the train. And he was complaining in a really loud voice right across the carriage. Oh, for God's sake, he said, I've got to go up to the Lowry Centre in Salford, he said. Um, I'm, I'm going to see a Paris Opera Ballet do uh, La Bayadere, and I've got to go all the bloody way to Salford for it, uh, because apparently there's no stage in London big enough to accommodate uh, the Paris Opera Ballet. And I took great pleasure in walking down the train and saying <laughs> to him, I hope you have a lovely evening <laughs> in the best art centre in the whole country. Uh, so that, that, that was, was, was one of my experiences. So, so I, I've always believed that arts and culture is a key um, instrument of regenerating communities because it does regenerate the area physically, you have lovely buildings and all of that, but the most important thing is you regenerate the people. Um, and one of the things I am concerned about now with the levelling up agenda, which is obviously flavour of the month and the right thing to do, but if we're not careful, all the levelling up money will go into physical infrastructure, the roads, the railways, the transport. They love a high-vis jacket, um, they, <laughs> they love a hard hat. You can have your photo taken and you've got something you can show. But actually, if you don't also um, help the people to change and to achieve their potential and do the things that they can do, and that is very much for me through beauty and art and culture and fineness, then you will end up in 10, 15 years time, the infrastructure will look a bit jaded and you will not have truly created regeneration. Um, so I'm trying to argue with, uh, not argue, I'm trying to um, help Michael Gove uh, understand <laughs> that in this programme, you have got to change the place, but people live in places and therefore you have to help the people. And that for me is through social investment, it's through community organisations, it's through social enterprises, it's all the work that we do at the very local level in our communities, that's what changes lives. So I want there to be a significant amount of investment in the people um, as well as the place. The things I'm doing at the moment, um, I'm an enthusiastic member of the network. I'm not an artist. Um, I learned so much from everybody who's on the network and Stefan and um, I mean, Kate is amazing. Uh, Kate's been working really hard on uh, funding bids just recently um, and we managed to make a bit of progress, we managed to persuade Sellafield to give us some money for the network so that we can um, carry on and be stronger and involve more people. Um, I get frustrated. Nobody ever wants to fund infrastructure because it's not sexy and um, they all want a project. How do they think projects are going to happen unless you've got some infrastructure to be able to deliver it? Yeah. Sellafield have made a really brave decision. They're funding the Cumbria Social Enterprise Partnership. They're funding CVS. They've just taken on a mental health charity. They recognise you've not got to fund those. the organisation. Yeah. Are they not funding you? No. We'll have a word later. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I've got to know them quite well. I've worked for the NDA. I've done two big reports on social value and impact. I took the social value act through Parliament just before I left. Um, it basically means that you can mobilise the one and a half billion pounds the NDA spends in the supply chain because nobody's going to get a public sector contract unless they can show a minimum of 10% of social value in that contract. What I want them to do is to include arts and culture in that social value proposition. So we are, we are now getting there. Um, and Gary McKeating, who's the head of social impact at Sellafield, is a fantastic photographer um, and he loves the arts. So that helps a bit. Um, I've now just opened some conversations with BAE Systems. Um, I want to get them in the same place, looking at creativity as a way of really making social and economic impact um, as well in the area and I have a discussion with them in the next few weeks. I chair Well Whitehaven, which is a small regeneration project on the Myris estate. Um, I've uh, recently got to know Dan um, Whitehouse, who's the new guy at Rose Hill Theatre. He's like manna from heaven um, <laughs> because that place has been very exclusive. Kids, kids never go in. Um, he's now even organising transport to bring the kids up from the Myris estate and to experience that fineness and beauty and quality and ambition um, that they will find there. And it, it, it is just incredibly heartening. And yesterday we had a session around the West Cumbria cultural strategy, lots of people, loads of energy in the room um, about how we are going to do that. And again, it is about quality. And, and I just finished on this because I know I could just talk forever. Um, but there's something about for me, it's not the quality necessarily of the producers, it's the confidence of the community to expect quality. Yeah. Because a lot of people from working class communities, and, and this happened to me in Whitehaven when I first started going up, I said to this guy, well, what do you think of, you know, this and this? He said, well, it'll do for us. 
And it's that bit that really winds me up. You know, it's all right for us because, you know, we don't expect anymore. We don't deserve anymore. <clears throat> and I just want the demand for quality um, to be from the sector, but I want it even more to be from the community. Why haven't we got the best dance, the best music, the best art, you know, everything else. That, that quality should never, ever be reserved for the people who have money and power and influence, that quality should be, you know, really to change people's lives. So I think we have a job of work to do to move people on from, well, I suppose it's okay for us because it isn't. So I want them also to be a bit angry um, about it. And if it isn't good, um, and, and you know, when we had those three young people that came to the network and we did that session um, and, and we talked about disability, we talked about race, we talked about um, the barriers and the blockages, I have never forgotten that yeah. um, because I felt humbled um, by the fact that we had amazing artists in the room who were doing fantastic work. Oh, you're here and, and you were doing fantastic work. And, and I honestly did. I felt humbled by what you were doing, despite all the barriers of transport and money and access and everything else because you had that commitment to the highest quality of what you wanted to do so you changed my life a bit that day and I'll be grateful to you forever so thank you thank you very much um, we're mending this plane as we fly it. <laughs> um, so I have been uh, tipped off that the best thing to do is to keep the camera still. And I do apologise to Hazel for invading her space. I did wash this morning. <laughs> um, we've been told that the sound is better when we stay still and that hopefully people at home can see us better. Um, so I'm going to invite our, our next speaker to take this chair, Janet, when we get oh, around okay. to it. But before yeah. we do that, we've just got a few minutes for questions to Hazel in response to what she just said. And thank you so much, Hazel, thank you. And in fairness, I think what I'd like to do is invite, invite a question from our Zoom audience first, if that's possible. So to do this, please put questions in chat and Amy can let me know about any of those. And otherwise, if you could raise your Zoom hand um, and that way we'll, we'll have an idea of anyone that would like to ask Hazel a question. So if you do have a question and you're there on Zoom, please put your hand up. And we'll um, keep an eye on the screen behind us to see if anyone has any questions. Or Amy, if there's anything in chat, which I'm afraid, despite the specs, I can't read from here, um, do let us know. So an opportunity for any questions on Zoom. And to save any boring hiatus whilst we're organising that, I will go back to the live floor. So are there, are there any questions here? Yes, Tom Spate. Hazel, great work. Thank you very much. Um, if you had landed, so I can't remember how you got from Salford to Cumbria, there's probably a story there somewhere, but if you'd gone from Salford to say Cornwall, or to Norfolk, or to Herefordshire, would, would there have been, would you have met the same challenges, observations, interests, or is there a Cumbrianness about what you've met in Cumbria that is Cumbrian? Could we just repeat the question if that's okay? So. Tom's asking about um, particular challenges in Cumbria compared to other experiences that Hazel's had elsewhere. Or if you've gone to another part of the UK, is, is, there, so my, my, is there something about Cumbria that is a particular challenge for ambition and quality, or are we just like every other part of the UK? No, I, I think we are different. Um, and I was thinking before I came, you know, about Tracy Emin and Margate, and, you know, in, in lots of places there, there is more ambition. Um, and in a way, that, that's a nice part of the Cumbrian culture, that people are modest, um, but you can be too modest. And, and if, you, if you don't think you're worth it, then you don't push. Um, and, and I think there is something about that. It's this, well, it'll do for us kind of thing. Um, and, you know, um, I'm, I'm now involved with the Save Grange Lido. Um, we've got a great team there and they're really ambitious, you know, and, and we're going to make it happen. But it's confidence. I, I think there's something about confidence. And, you know, if, if you're not brought up um, to be told you're brilliant, you're wonderful, you're amazing, and, and you don't have that, then it's quite difficult in adult life to acquire that later on, that confidence. But I think it's growing. Um, and the more you nurture people and feed them and, you know, they get access to some resources, then, then look, look, look on the network, the people and, and the young people who are here. But it's that barrier. And, and 
as I say, I, I quite like some of it because you don't want to live in a community full of boastful people who say, aren't I amazing? Um, but I want to see more, more self-confidence and that we deserve this. We're, we're worth it, if you like, you know, um, this part of the country. And, and I think the geography militates against it. You know, if I want to go up to Whitehaven, it's two hours there, it's two hours back. I live in Grange over Sands now before I lived in Kendall. You know, everything's so far away um, and that costs money. And if you haven't got a car, you know, I, I think that... I think there should be a proper examination of what are the barriers and what can we do to mitigate that as well as confidence building. Thank you. A Amy, did you spot any questions on, on no, Zoom? Amy has said no questions on Zoom. Oh, very quiet from the 25 people who joined us on the Zoom. Back, oh, question from the back, please. Okay, my name's Jill. Um, I'm working at the University of Cumbria, 2007, eight, something like that. And at the time, there was a great effort um, to reach out from Carl and Ambleside to the West Coast. I can hear people still saying the same thing now, and I wonder what collaboration you are having in your efforts from the schools, from the local education sector. Yeah, um, I, I, I think you're right that, you know, efforts have been made and maybe not been as successful. I, I, oh, I have to sit down for the camera. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I, I just love to have eye contact with people, so that's all right. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think you're right um, about that. But two things I would say, we've got the West Cumbria Cultural Strategy. This is the first time that they've done this. This is Allerdale and Copeland. Um, I've been helping on the Creative People and Places bid. Um, that we put in we didn't expect to get it we had a terribly hard interview from the arts council it was grinding you know um, <laughs> and so when they came back and they said you've got it um, and I think that's eight hundred thousand pounds and we're going to get some match from Sellafield you know that's a big pot of money for us to be able to implement some of the strategy so I'm really pleased they've come together because you can have a great strategy but if you haven't got any resource behind it you're not going to be able to make it happen and um, so I, I do think this time um, we've got a chance of doing it. The fact that Dan's at Rose Hill, that's going to be a, you know, a big shift for us. We're going to take um, art out to people. There's going to be like a caravan. Um, so it won't be expecting people just to come to venues. You've got to go to where they're at. So, that, you know, there's a lot of creative thinking now uh, around that. And obviously local government reorganisation is going to happen. There'll be the bigger unitary council. Um, so that could go two ways. We could have to get ignored or actually we'll have a bigger base to work from in terms of resource and, and backing. So I I'd, I'd be, you know, 70% on the optimistic side at the moment of that change, but the relationship with schools is absolutely crucial. The younger um, that you're exposed um, to art and beauty and, and, and music, then it will stay with you for life. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there was another question from the floor, I think. Yeah, I, I really appreciate your comments, actually, about your appreciation for beauty and fineness. And just thinking about what Tom said earlier about Cumbrianness, do you feel that in some ways that Cumbria is competing with the beauty of the landscape in order to meet that ambition? And do you think the landscape has an opportunity somewhere to meet that ambition? Yes, I do. I think it's a great, a great question. Um, and, and I didn't mention it. I do think the issue of masculinity in Cumbria is an issue, you know, um, the, the, the jobs that people do, the mining, now the nuclear, um, you know, it's all stem which is fine um but i've said to the nda you need to move to steam you need creative people in the room because they'll look at problems in a different way you'll get thought diversity you'll have a much more effective organization but i think it's the masculinity as well as the geography which is a bit of an issue oh that's not really for me i don't really do that i play rugby um and so i i, I think um that that is that is um one of the issues for us and i'm very conscious i'm not answering your questions so um just remind me the last bit um, it was a question about how oh, the, the landscape, landscape can the landscape com compete? Um, I don't think it competes. One of the most compelling things that I saw on the network, Kate, um, was the lady who, who'd done a landscape project, but she'd actually done it through poetry. And so she'd looked at things and then left um, poems um, and, and other, other things that would resonate with people. So she brought the landscape in. The landscape wasn't competing. The landscape was actually reinforcing the beauty of the place. Um, but beauty of landscape is kind of quite easy for us all because we can see it visually and we can experience it. The beauty of people, um, I think is quite hard to find sometimes in there. So I would like to see more of those collaborative projects that bring in the landscape, but view it through a lens of confidence and, and you know, working class backgrounds and 
Otherwise, it can be a very middle class experience. You know, it can certainly be a very white experience, um, the landscape. It can be a bit exclusive. So I think there's a job to be done, um, hopefully with the National Park and everybody else, to make that much more accessible than it currently is. Okay. One final question from the floor. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> You're speaking, I think I'm right in saying, about people who are culturally unreached and talking about the extraordinary lengths that are going to, to make them reachable. I'm just wondering if many of the targets are already reached by different quality of culture. They enjoy music, of sort that they enjoy, um, the art. Um, many will have smartphones in their pockets with a creative intent to go on social media. I'm just wondering if we're looking at quite the, the right arts too. Uh, yep, uh, great question. Um, and in Whitehaven, uh, we have tried um, and, and are still uh, working on involving young people in the art that they want to see. Um, and that will be much more digital. Um, it will be um, street art. You know, there's a fine line between street art and graffiti for me, but you know, it, where it, it lies on that line. Um, I'm involved with Save Grange Lido, um, and uh, we've got some street art actually in the Lido. So while it's been closed, young people have been going in, sneaking in, and expressing their own art in there. You know, and that's going to be quite a big line for us in terms of funding applications, stuff like that. So looking at, at where young people are, um, absolutely crucial. And that is starting to build in Whitehaven now, again, um, confidence to be able to come out and do it and finding some spaces in the empty shops to turn them into temporary uh, galleries that kind of thing that will leaven um, the town it'll attract more visitors so you get an economic benefit from it but you've got the young people actually participating in it but when you only had places which were um you know high culture and i don't like those definitions but you know um, very traditional culture very difficult to get young people to to relate to that so that's got to change as well both ends got to change got to empower the young people and for the the people who put on the cultural activities then they've got to have it in their minds and many of them do so I, I think it, we're, we're, changed, we're narrowing the gap, but I still think that there probably is a big gap for young people to come forward. That's why it was so good to see the young people on the, on the network. That, that sounds tremendous. Certainly in Millen, there was uh, for a short period a pop-up gallery. This was dealing with um, sculpture, principally in photography. So a fairly high-end, um, uh, uh, difficult uh, art to achieve. The place slowly, little by little, was full of kids. They all gravitated to it, wanted to know what was going on and how they could do it. I think all exactly the right lines. That was Irene Rogan in the middle of the view. Great. She was part of the network, indeed. Well, thank you for the questions. I'm assuming there's no more coming through on Zoom. Um, in which case, I'd like to thank Hazel Blues and thank you very much for that presentation. And I'd like you to play musical chairs with Janet, if that's all right. This is making my um, very easy. <laughs> and, uh, and indeed, Kate is going to pop over here to introduce Janet. Oh, which way are we doing? Yes. Is Kate going there first? It's all very exciting in the live space. Is Kate going there first? Actually, if you would, Kate, that would yes. probably help people at home. Thank you, Janet. That's all right. I'm not going to kneel. Uh, I don't have Stefan's knees. I'm, I was very worried about Stefan's knees. Uh, just briefly to introduce uh, Janet Walker, who is chief exec now of Anti-Racist Cumbria, now that they are uh, their fully fledged organisation with a, a staff structure as paid staff. Amazing achievement. Um, I went to the Anti-Racist Cumbria uh, Summit in November, which was another life-changing experience, seriously life-changing. Um, and so if, if we get just a tiny bit of that today, it will be amazing. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna, uh, yeah, let, let's swap places. Okay, and you crack on. Thank Super. you. Welcome, Janet. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to bring on my bits with me and I, hopefully I won't um, let the sound by having all my bits in the space. Um, I'm one of these people who actually really struggle to see with my glasses off and with my glasses on, so there might be a bit of that going on, but bear with me, I will do my best. So good morning to you all. Um, I hope um, everybody on Zoom can hear me okay. Um, as Kate said, I'm Janet and I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of Anti-Racist Cumbria. It's actually an honour to be speaking here this morning um, and it's great to see some familiar faces, Lorisiella. Um, 
But you know, one of the things that I want to mention right from the start of these 20 minutes or so that I'm going to be talking is that it never really gets any easier seeing no one who looks like you in the spaces that people like me inevitably have to occupy. Um, and believe it or not, it's actually really, really hard to come into these spaces every time and feel like you can bring your authentic self and feel that you fully belong in them. And it's just something that I want you to think about whilst I'm talking for the next 20 minutes. Um, and there's a lot of crossover with what Hazel was saying in terms of working class communities um, and people who are more mar marginalized. Um, but it's always difficult to be in these spaces. So, and racism is never an easy thing to talk about. Everyone's scared. Everyone's very, very nervous about it. Um, but go with me. Um, I'm passionate, um, but I'm never attacking, I don't think. Maybe sometimes. I try not to be. <laughs> <laughs> so very, very briefly, we have got oh, we have got a presentation. That's me, look on the screen. That's me. I don't yeah. know why they put a photo of me on there. Um, we've been going for about 18 months. Um, and as Kate said, in December, we became a charitable incorporated organization. Um, and on the 1st of January, I officially became the um, full-time employed uh, chief executive mm -hmm. of the organization. For anyone who doesn't know about us, haven't seen us, I hope you all have seen at least a little bit about us, we, are, we literally brand ourselves everywhere, um, then our aim is very simple. We want to make Cumbria the UK's first anti-racist county. It's got to be an actively anti-racist county. Um, and it's okay if we're not the first, we're not, it's not a competition in that sense. If somebody else gets there before us, absolutely brilliant, big pat on the back to them. But we know that it's absolutely a massive hill to climb, or here in Cumbria, it's a massive bell. Um, mm -hmm. And when, it's going to be a long way before we get to the top of it, but we want to get there and we want to bring as many people as possible with us when we do. I'm not going to talk about anti-racist Cumbria in any depth. Um, you can find us on our website and all of our social platforms. Um, we've got presence. Um, we reach a lot of people. We engage with a lot of people. So go and take a look, find out what we do, who we are and where we're going. I'm going to spend the 20 minutes focusing on this. So I think someone's going to click for me. Amy's, Is that right? Amy's going to click for me. Great. OK, <laughs> so I want to focus on the question that we've been asked to think about, uh, which yeah. Stefan and Kay um, have, have raised this morning. Uh, in terms of how we drive up ambition and quality across the Cumbrian culture sector. And Hazel focused a lot on working class. And I get, again, as I said before, there's a lot of crossover with what we do there. Uh, we come from very similar communities in terms of uh, deprivation and being marginalized groups. But I'm gonna focus very much on the anti-racism side of it. So um, Amy, if you can give me my first click, that would be great. Um, and what, I focus, what, what really we need to think about in order to answer that question is where we are now and where do we want to be? And it's no secret that here in Cumbria, it's a primarily a white county. We've already started having questions about that and the, demo, de, the, the demographics here. It's about 98% at the last center, census, which was almost 12 years ago. We're about to get another census results anytime in the next few months. Um, and until recently, at least, most of the sectors, all of the sectors, I would say, come very much from a white perspective. And that includes the arts. So whether that's music, dance, theatre, if we're talking about museums, any connection with black history is skimmed over at the very best. And I remember when my kids were young, they're, they're, they're 11 and 9 now, and we don't go to the library so much as we once used to. But um, the library in Windermere, where I live, um, the poor women behind the desk, when they used to see me come in with my list of books, what they needed to get on their shelves, they're like, oh, she's here again. <laughs> um, and, you know, their response to me was that um, there wasn't anyone else who needed those books. So the perspective has been very, very white for a very, very long time. But where do we want to be? Well, in line with the ACE investment principles, which you will all know way better than I probably ever will, but you're all familiar with them. Kate's touched on them again today. The intention is to better reflect the ri richness and diversity of the country with a focus on work that brings value to communities, not just professionals and partners, and that programs 
will carefully consider the diversity of participants. So can we have another click, please? So what are the barriers that are in the way of that intention of the ambition of Cumbria's culture sector? I think we may have, we may have crashed, have we crashed? You haven't crashed on the screen, that laptop is having a, a bit of a Saturday morning moment. Cool, first. I'll just keep go, <laughs> yeah. going, that, you have your Saturday morning moment, I'll just keep just, on going. Yeah. So there are several hurdles and barriers that I see that are in the, in the, uh, in the way. And one of the big questions that need to be asked is, who is discussing these issues? Who do you have around your tables? Does everyone around your tables look like all the people who are in this room, apart from me and Ella? Um, there's this big thing about diversity. It's not a term that I like, it's not a term that I like to use, and I'll tell you why a little bit later. But the question is, is your table really diverse? Have you thought about how you can get people who don't look like you around that table, really? Think about who sits on your boards or even the skills you say people need to be able to sit around these boards and to sit at these tables. Are there other ways to get them around the table so that they can contribute and bring a richness and difference to the decisions that are being made? Most black and brown people and working class people are busy keeping the roof over their, the roof over their heads and food on the table. Most boards are made up of retired, white, wealthy, people with time on their hands who can be on those boards and carry on making those decisions without people who look like me. There are other ways to think about how people can be involved People will always say to me, but we can't pay people on boards because it's not fair. But let's just stop for a minute and think about equity and equality, because I don't think people really understand what those two terms mean. And it's actually really, really important. And it's one of the things that people can think about in changing the way their organisation looks. So if I get everybody in this room and everybody on the Zoom £500 each, that would be equal. I've given everybody exactly the same. We've all got the same amount. But Kate, she might go, 500 quid, happy days. I'm going to treat myself to a very nice bottle of crystal champagne. Um, and we're going to go and have a picnic, by the way, and have a great time. I don't know why I thought about you, but let's, I'm just giving people examples. Giving people as examples. It's not Kate, but let's go with Kate. Andrew might say, oh, that flashing light on my car, which I had to budget, I'm having a budget for, and I can't do it until next month, because I haven't got quite enough to, to do it this month. It's January, everybody knows, everybody's got no money, right? So I'm gonna to have to wait till next month, but now I've got this 500 quid, I can go and get that flashing light fixed on my car. Happy days, and I can get a bottle of Prosecco with the change. So he's done all right. This lady here, however, might be saying, thank goodness I've given five, been given 500 pounds. I can now make sure that the gas isn't cut off. And not only do I have to worry about the gas being cut off, I also have to worry about if it is cut off, how am I going to feed the children? Because I've got a gas oven and I won't be able to cook. If we did this with equity, this lady would get 500 pounds. Andrew would get enough to be able to fix his car and you're not having a bottle of Prosecco. <laughs> Kate doesn't need anything at all. Kate's got plenty. <laughs> Kate's got loads. She doesn't need the extra. She can probably buy 10 bottles of crystal champagne because she's actually got enough to be able to manage. So it's about need. And going back to that table, if we start to think maybe everybody at the table doesn't need to be retired, and maybe we think about when we're doing our funding pots that we actually include in that pot a sum to pay some of these people working class young, black, brown, we might get diversity, real diversity, I still don't like the word, at our tables. And that's the difference. If you have black and brown people around the table, or if you don't have them around the table, whose ambition is it if everyone hasn't been heard? How can you be sure that you're including my voice, and people who look like me's voices 
in deciding what that ambition should be or what that ambition should look like. I often get set told, you know, when we put out these adverts for jobs and we put out these adverts for people to come and join our organizations and be on our boards and come to this working group, if we put on there that we're welcoming, we put on there that we're inclusive. Some people even go so far as to put on there that they're tolerant. How nice of that. <laughs> and nobody ever comes, nobody ever applies, we just don't get them. But maybe you're thinking about it the wrong way. Maybe the question you need to be asking yourselves is, why aren't people coming into our spaces? Are your spaces safe? Do your spaces practice anti-racism? Not just diversity or equality or inclusion, but actual anti-racism. I've spoken to so many organizations in this last year and a half that Anti-Racist Cumbria has been going and the amount of them that asked me to come sit on the board, come and be a part of this. They tell me that they have had consultants go out there, some of those consultants actually come to me and ask, say to me, will you come and sit on so-and-so's board? That consultant is often not very diverse, probably female, usually white. Who are your consultants? Why are they white? How are they going to reach black and brown people and hear them? Remember what I said at the beginning about coming into these spaces and feeling like we can bring our authentic selves. And even if you do hear us, how are you going to interpret that back through that lens? How are you gonna feed that back in? Yes, representation does matter, but it needs to be genuine representation, not representation for the sake of representation. And also valuers, the amount of times that I'm asked by these consultants who have been bought in to make it diverse, mm -hmm. to come and be in the advert so that they can put the advert out there so that they can look diverse, and I say, are you going to pay us for that? And they go, oh no, there's no money in the budget to pay you for that. There's only a money in the budget to pay a very expensive white consultant to come and ask me to be in that advert so they can tell everybody else that they are diverse and that they're inclusive and that all of these people need to be part of the room. So it's about whether you just want to look good or whether you have any genuine intention to actually do better. And there's a huge gap at the moment in that. And that's one of the things that we need to change. Can we have another click, please, if it's still doing something somewhere? <laughs> good, 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 good. Um, Kate touched on this, and one of the questions that came through was about um, um, holding on to our cultural heritage. And I mean, look at us, look at where we are today. I mean, no one can deny that where we live is literally the best place in the world, right? Apart from Jamaica. <laughs> no, that's the best, the best place in the world. But this is close, this is very close. Um, but we do have to question whether we've fallen into a trap of relying on our heritage alone here or relying on it far too much. Is it off put into a newer, younger, braver, browner, black audience? Who does it speak to? And who holds the money to allow it to speak? I'm not saying get rid of Wordsworth. And I, never, I would never say get rid of the curriculum. Far from it. But does Wordsworth speak to black and brown communities? How does Wordsworth's current audiences view Wordsworth in a wider cultural perspective? I'm not picking on Wordsworth, by the way. I actually really like Wordsworth. I'm just giving it as an example. I could have gone for the rabbit in the blue jacket, but I decided <laughs> to leave him alone. Um, the point is, the point is in all seriousness, can we think about redefining who we represent and how we represent those people? Can we judge it up? Can we get more disruptive? If an NPO, for instance, is relying on ACE funding, should the NPO be thinking about how they challenge what ACE requires of them? Does ACE have any real understanding of the issues? Because who are sitting around their tables when they make these decisions? Another click. And again, I think Lady at the Back talks about this in terms of education, but 
quality needs to start before university. Already, if we're just at that level where we're going into the university level and starting to draw on people, we have missed a whole raft of people below in the education system. Right now, Caribbean boys are performing in the region of seven times worse than their white counterparts. Working class boys are not much better. So really, we need to start thinking about doing things differently. It's here where representation can have a genuine, play a genuine part, because if we see ourselves, we actually know ourselves. And we've already said music, dance, theatre, history, so much history, it's rich in history. And now we're seeing more and more books by black authors about black characters. So it is all there. And this is where the arts can really play a big part. They can work, work with our schools in order to ensure that that change is starting to happen, that we're driving up that ambition from a really early age. We can't make an anti-racist county without every other sector playing its part and every other sector playing its part with each other because actually we're just one big jigsaw and we're all pieces of that jigsaw and we all need to put that jigsaw together in order for it to fit and we can then lay it out really, really nicely. But as networks and as arts and culture people and as organisations, have you thought about how you can better work with our schools, how you can create equitable talent, equitable, talented pipelines to real paid life work? Can you collectively lobby for more investment into the arts and culture in schools? That is being drained constantly all the time. I really liked your comment about STEAM, Hazel. I was trying to fit in, how do we get STEAM to turn into a word that fits in black and brown, STEAM bubba? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, we'll have to work on that one. But that's the kind of thing that we need. Do you know what the GCS courses are offering right now? I am not a hugely arty person, but I brought these two books along because this book is probably an old edition of it. I don't know if you can see it on the Zoom. It's probably an old edition of it. But I'm struggling to find a black or brown artist in there. Here, all those pages that are flagged, a British black and brown artist. Where are they in our schools? When are they being shown? When are, where are they in the GCSC? When they're creating these courses and these curriculums, why are we not talking about these people? Why are we only talking about these people? How can we influence that change and get schools and um, examining bodies to start thinking more about being more inclusive in that way? It's a massive, I've said already, it's a massive bell, it's huge. But if we're gonna drive up ambition, we need to be ambitious in driving up ambition. And here in Cumbria, if we're gonna go for it, we may as well go for it boldly because we may as well be hung for a sheep as a lamb literally in this county. So it's really important that we work together. These are big asks, but they're things that we can do to start making that change. And I'm probably running out of time, so I'm gonna do one last click. I said that I would explain why I don't like the word diversity. And ACE policies are a prime example of that. So it's really fitting. Diversity allows organizations to rely on groups such as women and young people primarily. But it tends to miss out all the marginalized groups, black, brown, working class, transgender, gay, all of those groups tend to be more easily fit into the big, the big scheme of diversity. So what it does is it allows organizations to say they're diverse. The amount of times people will say, we've got a really diverse organization, we've got 50% women. I'm like, that is only one form of diversity. Let us call it what it is. Let's stop using these words that allow us to water it down, allow us to be performative, allow us to tick boxes and say, yes, we are diverse. Yes, we've been diverse. We got these people in. This course, what, these, what all these, these young people have been on, one of the questions I asked when I was, when I was getting ready for this, um, this piece today was, how many black and brown people were on the course? And I got a very, 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 very lovely answer back. And it was very long. It told me about all the diversity that was on the course. And I was like, yeah, you don't answer my question. Where anybody on the course, black or brown? Turns out Ella was on there. So yay, at least one. Um, but when we talk about diversity in that way, it means that we can keep channeling it into other ways rather than actually going, actually, we're not getting any black and brown people onto these courses. 
And rather than commissioning white consultants to go and try and bring those audiences in, commission your white consultant if you like, but get them to speak to people like us and pay us to help reach those harder to reach groups. Or go really, really mad and just commission a black or brown consultant for a change. That might actually also make a big difference. Because if you commission someone who looks like you, they are going to think like you and they are going to do like you. And how can we drive ambition when we keep moving around in those same little pools? So if I'd have been on the ace around the ace table when they were deciding on their um, creative plan, if they'd have involved people like me like that, I would have said, first of all, stop calling it diversity. Let's just talk about what it is. Let's break them down into their actual sections. Let's lock, stop lumping people all together like we do with BAME. We are actually groups and communities and individuals and we have different needs. Some of those intersectional, some of those not. But let's stop calling it diversity because it makes it too easy. And instead, the first question I think that I should be asking organizations is not to evidence diversity so that lots of boxes can be ticked, First of all, do better as organizations so that you, be, how are you doing better so that you can become diverse? I'd move away from metrics of, in five years time, we will have X number of black or brown people in our organization. And three years later, X percentage of them will be moving up, up the ladder, up the career ladder and be, being promoted. I'd move away from those metrics. What I would be saying to ACE is seek out and fund the organizations that are saying in five years time, we, have gone, we, have, we, we would have gone down an anti-racist journey and we'll be so far down it that we will feel way more confident to start to recruit because we know we understand their needs. We understand the lens that they're looking through. We know we can give them a voice around the table. We know that we are gonna be creating a safe space for them. And we know that they are going to want to come to our organization because everything we do is shaped and has the ethos of anti-racism through it. That's what ACE should be looking at. If they put the right people around the table, they might actually do better with their diversity program rather than they're currently doing. Just before we go, Oh, just before I go, before I stop talking, because like Hazel, I could literally talk all day. <laughs> um, bear in mind that driving up ambition and quality in Cumbria, when it comes to anti-racism, you do not need black and brown people to be in your organization for it to be anti-racist or in your network for it to be anti-racist or your, in, your, in your funding streams for it to be anti-racist. You just need to be anti-racist so that black and brown people want to be and feel able to be and are part of being heard when they're in your organizations. In short, it's about feeling like we belong. Not like we're included, but that we belong. I think if we click it, it'll say any questions. <laughs> That's all right, I washed too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Janet. Um, we do have time for a couple of questions before our final keynote speaker, Janet. So I'm, I'm going to ask if there are any on Zoom. Um, I can see a question on Zoom from Jenny Lee, who's actually our researcher at Brave Age. Is that a question or are you clapping? Sorry, Jenny's saying she's, don't ask me a question, she's just clapping. And I've misread the hand sign. Sorry, Jenny, let's chat on Monday and I'll apologize <laughs> Okay, so if there are no questions on the Zoom, um, there's a question from the floor here from Andrew. I'm hoping this will turn into a question while I'm saying it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic to hear what you're saying and the way you're saying it. Um, I was I'm surprised, um, in a sense, to hear you connecting um, working class with, with Black. Because um, I do that, and I sometimes feel a little... Um, uncertain about that. But Hazel brought this up, and I've got a similar background to you, Hazel, um, which I won't go into or bore anyone with, um, unless you ask me later. But it seems to be fundamental 
in the way that the arts establishment works, in that it isn't middle, uh, isn't working class and it excludes working class. And I'm not, not even sure I like that term. It's about income, it's about um, aspiration, um, poverty of aspiration, it's about poverty. Um, and there's tons of, of that problem within Cumbria and within the Lake District in particular. It's really obvious if you've got the eyes to see that it's built into the whole thing. Um, the question hasn't arisen yet. <laughs> I'm trying to get there for you. Um, so I've got this exclusion of working class or low socioeconomic group, which is endemic within the Lake District. Yeah, yeah within Cumbria, yeah. within the country. We tend not to talk about it. I think it's refreshing that you managed to bring up some of these things. You brought up consultants, and consultants have been the bane of certainly my life for 40 years. Um, that's another question as well. It's how do we how do we ask you also talked about being disruptive, mm -hmm. um, which is I think is the, one of the fundamental um, purposes of artists and the arts is disrupting causing to see things differently, think about things differently. Um, somehow we've had that smoothed over, mm -hmm. um, and I think you're sort of hinting at that in your your um, comments around how we introduce diversity. Um, and the way that using those words in those terms, we can smooth over a lot of things because it then appears to be all right because we've fulfilled those things. This is a question. I just. <laughs> 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 you made some really, really valid points. You made some really valid points. I suppose the question is um, how do we make that happen in a broader, richer, quicker way? Yeah. And I, 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 I think there's a, a massive piece of power between the working class and black and brown communities. We have much more in common than we don't. And I think there's a real, for many, many, many years, we have been told that we don't have anything in common. You only need to look at pockets in places like Barrow, um, where fear is spread and immigration and county lines and all of those things. So we are pushed apart constantly and we have a, we would be much stronger and everybody knows it in politics if we were actually working together more closely. So that is one huge fundamental point, and that's why it was so interesting to hear Hazel this morning. But also in addition to that, I think that whole thing about being disruptive, I think the way that we do that is change the way that we sit around the table. And actually, it's okay to just pay some people that sit around the table. Do you know what I mean? To bring their bring, bring what they can bring and not think this isn't fair because we talked about that old 500 quid where Katie did well. Um, and it's about thinking about things like that. How can you get those people in the room? If you're going to have a consultant, how are they going to reach people to be on these courses so that they are properly representative of everybody who should be involved? Thank you. Um, without closing down the conversation, uh, we will have the opportunity to explore what Janet's been saying in the group discussion later. And Janet's with us for, for the rest of the morning. So um, I'd like to thank Janet. Thank you very much, Janet. <laughs> um, and we will move on to our, our final keynote speaker, Lindsay Jackson. And we'll do a bit of, uh, we won't do any musical chairs because Lindsay is joining us uh, on Zoom. Um, hello. Oh, hello, Lindsay. <laughs> I don't know if I'm shouting as though I would reach you. <laughs> no, I like it. I like it. It's like, it's okay. like having a phone conversation with my mum. <laughs> that would be great. If, if we could have Lindsay on speaker view. Um, uh, Lindsay Jackson is deputy CEO of Edinburgh Festival Fringe Society. Um, has had an extraordinary career herself, but also has a very special relationship with many of the people in this room because she, I've been told how inspiring she was when she met the cohort of students on the Changing Culture Programme, when they actually managed to go to the Edinburgh Festival last year. I don't know how they did that, but they did. Uh, and so it's a real pleasure to have Lindsay here. Uh, Lindsay, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you, mostly so you don't have to look at my face. And I've got some nice fingy pictures, but um, I suspect that the reason the group um, enjoyed talking to me is because I was pretty frank with them. It was the middle of the festival. I was quite tired. They got a, a, a less polished version of, of the truth. Um, so as, uh, as was said, I'm Lindsay. I work at the Fringe in Edinburgh. Um, and in the session in the summer with the Changing 
um, culture program group. It was quite a personal chat about um, leadership and where we are. And the same is true today. I think this is mostly coming from my perspective. Um, and I think I'm mostly going to focus on ambition, which is good because I think that uh, it's different to what we've already talked about um, and uh, yeah, Janet certainly has given us a lot to think about um, and I hope that there's some correlation. And also, I just feel like this little guy just sums up all of our moods, which is partly why I chose this picture because it's very lovely. So in terms of ambition, why, why do I work at the Fringe? Um, and before we get into ambition, I think it's important to establish what the Fringe is. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail because um, we don't have time, but the, the Fringe is special because it is an open access festival. And what that means is there isn't a curator, uh, artist, an artistic director, uh, a jury, a selection committee who say that your work is good enough or quality enough to be part of the festival. If you have a story to tell and a stage on which to tell it, then you're welcome to come to the Fringe. It is, of course, not as simple about that. And uh, Janet made some really, really key points about equity rather than equality, which is where we, you know, at the Fringe Society, we spend a lot of time thinking about if it is an equal race, how do we make sure everyone's at the same start line in order to be able to have a chance of winning that race? Um, so, the, but the wonder of the fringe and one of the sort of remarkable things about the fringe in terms of how it pushes people into more ambitious spaces is because there's nobody who tells you you can't um, uh, other than yourself and caveat that with, you know, economic circumstances and, and life, but in principle, there's nobody stopping you. But in terms... Sorry to interrupt you. Can we just ask you to put your slides full screen so we can see them? Oh, sorry. Am I sharing the wrong screen? Is that what's happening? Uh, yeah, we've just got um, the PowerPoint show, as it were, rather than the full slide. Is that better? That's perfect. Thank sorry, you. are we sharing the wrong screen? You've got my notes. <laughs> <laughs> you, I'll, just, I'll just leave those there and then you guys can just have a chat amongst yourselves. Um, oh, no, it's not that good. <laughs> thank you. So, uh, so before we, um, before, when I was thinking about how to frame this, I, I realised there's only really one way to do it and that's to sort of think about yourself. So um, I come from a, a sort of very working class family in Birmingham, uh, sort of grew up on uh, benefits uh, and actually the in that scenario, we've talked a lot about a working class experience today. And I think um, many of you will recognize the scenario when your life is very limited by things like economic circumstances. The horizon of your ambition is very immediate and um, the, the, the sense of ambition that you might have is only ever stretched to the horizon that you can see. Uh, so I don't think that um, we should think about ambition in terms of asking six-year-olds what they want to be when they grow up and then holding to that. I think we need to think about ambition in terms of an iterative process. So, you know, the first instance, it was get some GCSEs. That was, you know, that was a big, that was a big benchmark. Um, you know, A-levels were, were a novelty and were, um, were quite unusual. In fact, it was quite unusual in my, me and my sisters were the, sort of the first generation of girls in our family not to have children by the time we were 18. You know, this is, this, this is the lived reality of that. Um, I had my eyes open to the idea that I could work in theatre which was just mind blowing to me. And that stretched that horizon um, slightly further. I thought I was gonna be an actress, but I was terrible, so bad, so bad. Uh, so I went off to university, which was an opportunity again, that had never been afforded to, to people in my family. Um, I thought about teaching because there's no money unless I earn it myself. So I, I needed a job uh, and um, I, I realized that that wasn't stretching where I wanted to be. I wanted to be working in theater. So. While uh, having a job, I worked with some friends on a theatre company. I did that for a few years. I then ran a slightly bigger theatre company, uh, which wasn't as satisfying. Um, and then the fringe job came up, which I've been doing in various versions of it for uh, nearly 10 years now. And, and that was a big stretch of my ambition. At that time, I was the head of operations, which was a huge stretch. And I never, 10 years ago, had the ambition in my head that I would be the deputy CEO of the largest arts festival in the world. And I certainly didn't think about that when I was, you know, sort of 17, thinking about whether I might go off to university. Um, and I think it's it's just important to acknowledge um, that ambition is not sort of, ambition is not born overnight and um, exceptionalism and, and um, quality and creativity is not born overnight. You're not born a concert pianist. You're not born uh, a gymnast. You're not born a world record, a uh, hundred meter sprint sprinter. You might have natural attributes that can be trained and, and developed, but nobody is born amazing. Everybody needs to be developed and, um, and have their themselves stretched as they go. Um, and then my second point um, is the risk of the perception um, 
that it's all down to the individual. Uh, I've given you some exceptional individuals in this slide. Uh, our bottom two gentlemen um, who very much uh, live in that rhetoric of they've worked hard and they've strived and they've achieved, but these men are only billionaires because they've exploited other people and they, they've taken advantage and they've taken resource that belongs to other people. Uh, and they've taken that for themselves rather than in any way thinking about a, a collective or, or collaborative act. Um, Molly May, who I genuinely have no idea who she is, some of the some of the kids in the room can fill us in, you know, is in trouble for suggesting we all have the same 24 hours in a day. And I guarantee you that for most of you in the room, we've seen many people who do nothing but work hard and still don't get what, what you would deserve in that space. You see people who strive every day, who are working and toiling every day and aren't getting aren't getting the sort of the, the financial or, or economic rewards that others might be. This notion of, of, you know, grinding. I love Beyonce, you know, she's stacking her paper. It's brilliant. But but this this false notion that we're supposed to be able to achieve anything if we just work hard enough and we just work um, if we just work enough and want it enough. And, and that makes it a failure of the individual. Um, and I think that that needs to be addressed and acknowledged if we're going to start seriously talking about ambition. Because really, you know, as the, as the beautiful image says from a fringe show, we are, um, you know, we're a nation of, of people. Um, and in the arts, it should be about a community and it should be about collective effort. Um, it should be about uh, working together. It should be about collaboration. And it shouldn't be about competition. There should be space to, to do things differently, space to, to work with different groups of people and space to see the world from a different perspective. Um, so I have, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go be so bold as to call them top tips, but these are the sort of things that have risen to the top for me. Um, that in terms of answering that question of how do we drive up quality and ambition, I think we need to be collectively anti-competitive. I think we need to stop pitting creatives against creatives. I think we need to stop thinking about each other in terms of my thing was more successful than your thing and my thing was better, you know, got more five-star reviews than your thing. I think we need to actively reject the notion of competition, which in and of itself is, uh, is defined quite often by the parameters that are put on us by funders. Um, the beauty of the fringe is it's largely unfunded. The fringe society itself is not funded. Many of our artists are self-financing. And that means it's still a very competitive environment, but it means that they're not, we're not being driven to be competitive before we're even making the work. Um, I think we need, uh, and I think some of what some of what Janet um, was saying comes into this is, is we need to re, we need to re rebirth solidarity um you know the union movement has is, is long gone although and i suspect cumbria has um has strong sense of this particularly with a sort of um, old mining history but we need to start thinking about how we are collectively um and standing in solidarity with our colleagues our peers our co-creators our friends our audiences our, our communities in order to demand better and to demand that we are we're given the opportunity to collectively showcase what we can do um, I think that there has to be space for risk um, and you only get quality and you only get new and you only get exciting and you only get boundary pushing if people can take risks. Um, but risk is a luxury um, because risk is inherently coming with failure and it's very difficult to fail. Uh, or to allow yourself to take a risk that might lend in failure if that failure is absolutely the end of your career, especially if you have no financial uh, support network. So we need to under, underwrite and ensure the cost of failure because it's only through failure that we, we grow and we learn and, and we develop. And we need, to, we need to start thinking of failure as a tool rather than as, um, as a failure. I sort of said the word failure so many times now, it's lost all meaning. Um, I think we need to, to think about uh, and I, I guess I'm, I'm speaking more now to the the leaders and the um, the more established artists and careers in the room, which is um, we all need to start thinking about how we help other people address their skills gaps or how we help other people get to our level. Um, you know, the not closing the door behind us, uh, supporting people to to learn, to grow, not looking in job descriptions or in job posts for people who have skills already being open to the idea that we could train, we could develop, we could support, we have a duty to. Um, I'm only here because other people held my hand and said, it's all right, you'll figure it out. You know, I couldn't do my shooting fish job when 
I started and now my shooting fish job 12 years ago would be super easy. Like there's a there's a cycle here that says if we want this sector to, to thrive and we want people in this sector to thrive that don't look and sound like everybody else, you know, whether that's a class or race or disability or gender. It, it, we have to we have to handhold and we have to be open about um, ask a, a culture that says training is not uh, is not um, is not to be sort of sniffed at. It's not a dirty word to say you don't know. It should be accept, it should be it should be celebrated when people say I don't know. Let me learn. I don't know. Can I come and can I come and discover that that to me would be a, a transformational approach to how we do that. And I think those of us in sees uh, sort of salaried posts or sort of seasoned roles should be should be leading the way for that um i think that uh particularly in terms of uh, going back to failure and risk taking we um you have a right to live well we all have a right to live well we deserve not to be poor we deserve not to have to work four jobs uh, in order to create in our spare time we we all deserve to be able to um to share and showcase the work that we want um you know, we were asked what was in the way uh, and life is in the way. And people always say, oh, you know, the the act of creation is the privilege of the rich. But um, actually, when you think about the when when all else is out of the way and you can afford to do what you want with your time that so many people choose to create, we should be making that an opportunity for as many people as possible. Um, and we all deserve the right to live well uh, and to still be able to be creative and express ourselves in that space. Um, I'm not suggesting I have any of the answers to this, but these are some of the uh, the things that I think if you want to raise ambition and quality um, in the area, then we need to we need to think about. Um, and uh, specifically out of by London, um, the, uh, I think Hazel said why well, was really much better than I would have about the leveling up agenda. I think we, it remains to be seen um, what will come out of that. But um, if Hazel's got her eyes on Michael Gove, then um, that's great. Keep at it. If you need any help, then you know where we are. Uh, I think the country is changing. I think the <clears throat> Arts Council England um, certainly has an eye on not being too London centric and moving things to Manchester. And I think that we're going to see more and more emerging hubs uh, and more emerging spaces. Um, and I think that that has to be about communities demanding, but also um, the funders actively supporting. Um, and I think we have to think um, London is tired and desperate and difficult and expensive. Um, and we all have to think about what means to us. I think if if uh, if London is the place to be, but that means you're being unpaid or underpaid, it's entirely competitive. It's really cut through. You know, you, you've got this constant sort of need to make it. Is that really conducive to what your happiness is? You know, and I, my, my sort of final bullet point there is your happiness is not necessarily equal to. And that equal to needs to be filled in by you. For me, that my happiness is not necessarily equal to my salary. My happiness is not necessarily equal to, um, you know, my happiness is equal to my access to green space. The fact that I have a community of people, the fact that um, Edinburgh is a beautiful place to live in and, and I've got lots of places to go. Um, and I think it's about finding if you're going to extract yourself or not join the London the London rat race, then it's about finding parts of the country, uh, Dundee, Leeds, Birmingham, Manchester, Hull, Belfast, Edinburgh, Paisley, Bristol, Cumbria. These are all places with thriving, thriving cultural communities where you can have a, a meaningful career. Um, there's an exploration point that's needed there before we just decamp people to London. And finally, quality. I've only got two slides on quality because I have, I didn't feel in any way qualified to talk about quality. But um, actually, I think my, my main point here is qual it's such a subjective thing. You all know that. Um, and I think we've become bogged down with focusing on measuring quality on the output, whereas we should be measuring quality, quality if we're measuring quality at all, on skill, on development, on learning. Uh, and that shouldn't and can't be a universal metric. Um, so there is a responsibility on the people who are making these quality assessments to, and it goes back, I guess, to Janet's equity point, which is, you know, if you're starting from an entirely unskilled basis and your quality, your work has improved in its quality to the point where you're doing a 10 minute um, stand up set at an open mic night, that is as much a measure of success as, um, you know, Ed Gamble doing a UK tour with an hour long special that then gets put on Netflix. There, there has to be a different metric that measures just where you are in your in your career and I would argue we start measuring full stop and we start actually engaging in conversations um 
at the risk of sort of leaning into the the, the slightly artier, the arty waffle is, you know, we shouldn't, um, art's made to be shared, to be discussed, to be challenged. You know, the quality is often in the craft and sometimes not in the output. Um, there's this cultural phenomenon that we've been living through at the moment where you have to like or dislike something rather than say, you know, licorice pizza is a great example of it. I, I can see that it's a well-made film, but I thought it was terrible, boring. Nothing happened. I'm apparently I'm in the minority for that, but I can express that opinion. That doesn't mean that that film isn't quality, and it, the people that made that film shouldn't be celebrated for what they've done. But we've got into this space where we have to we have to measure you're right or you're wrong on the quality of something, um, and we we then measure that by volume or value or money or box office or or um, engagements whereas actually there's there's enormous amounts of high quality art that goes into people's front gardens into the way that people um you know engage in the saturday morning sessions with young people in youth football groups the, the, there's quality wherever you look for it you just have to look at a different metric um and i think that excellent shouldn't be a definition um but i do think we need to hold quality to account so we'll just finish on this um which is a great example from 2017's festival um Irvin welsh wrote two plays for the 2017 festival and they were not well received um and lynn gardner wrote a one-star review and that was published in the guardian and i spoke to lynn not long after the festival um and this came up in our conversation and um Lynn's position on publishing a one-star review is if this was an emerging company or a mid-stage career company, she wouldn't publish a one-star review. She'd give the company feedback. She'd explain to them why she wasn't publishing a review. She'd pass on her comments to them so that she was part of that critical discourse of which review is, is necessary and, and can be really valuable. Um, whereas actually the reason that she chose to publish this review is, is exactly what, what's covered in that that byline that there was a laziness. There's no quality in the craft that went into making this. There was a stick a big name on it, put them in a big venue, and it will be successful. And actually, that's why um, this sort of work is that, that quality does need to be held to account, but it needs to be held to, to account at, the, at a proportionate and, and relevant and respectable level. You know, Evan Welsh is a is a superstar in many ways and has has a huge name um, and so calling that out where people are bypassing quality to ride on their past successes is I think a really critical part of those conversations and I again as, as everybody else said could talk for hours to you here but uh, that is everything have some of our street performers um, and I'm happy to take any questions let me stop sharing if I can figure out how that works Lindsay thank you so much thank you um, <laughs> I hope you can hear those applause. Lots of nods in the room, lots of nods on Zoom in the chat. And thank you for raising those points. I was particularly taken with what you're saying about the competitive culture, mm -hmm. gladiatorial mainstream television being made, which gives people the idea it's all about fame rather mm -hmm. than. Thank you for raising those points. We have time for a couple of questions before we have a well deserved break. Um, are there any questions on Zoom, please? And whilst we're waiting for that, any questions from the floor? Just one or two questions before we have to let Lindsay go. <laughs> you've, you've knocked them out. <laughs> no, they all just they all need to pee and have a cuppa. That's what it is. And I, I fully respect that. that that's, that's a solidarity point. Hi, <laughs> Lindsay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, so I don't work for the Arts Council, um, but the Arts Council has a lot of money to give out um, to, in England, and obviously in Scotland, it's a different system, and in Wales, it's a different system as well. If I was the Arts Council, what would your advice be to me as to how, therefore, we do distribute public money for the arts? If some of the criteria, like quality, is up for discussion, well, what is the answer as to how they should, in a practical, realistic, not massively expensive way, how should they do it differently? Um. I think they should focus on funding artists. And I know that sounds really sort of simple and straightforward, but I think we've defaulted into organisations and institutions um, and the huge amounts of the money. There are obviously pots out of there for individual artists and emerging artists, but huge amounts of the money in England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland go to cultural institutions. And like Hazel said, they'll build the building, but they won't fund the work that then goes into the building and they won't um, they won't 
they went established there. And I think even through COVID and the excellent work that they they all did in trying to get money out, they still filtered that through organizations because it's easier for them to do that. And I think that a really honest conversation about a system that um, that supports artists and doesn't hold them to onerous reporting, doesn't hold them to onerous form filling, um, and uh, accepts and open is open to failure, is uh, is really important. There's a group of academics, um, one of whom based at Queen Margaret University in Edinburgh, who's working on a project about failure, um, and the. They did a series of interviews with the funding organizations about reporting, and most of them were pretty honest about the fact that they don't read end of grant reports because they don't have the time and they, they focus on getting the money out the door, which is the right way to focus, but they make you fill in the form anyway, when all they do is go and take the data out of it. And if you're an individual artist or you're a small emerging collective group and you're, you're doing it in the spare time or you've got two kids at home or you've got caring responsibility, then the organizations have the people for the paperwork. The people don't have the time for the paperwork. And I think think they need to upend the whole thing and, and artist first rather than organization first. And that doesn't mean I think we should unfund, unfund the cultural organizations. I just think we should address the balance. Lindsay, thank you. Yes. Um, I, I'm looking at the cohort of Changing Culture Programme students in case any of them even wanted you to say hello. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they are all smiling at you, yes. Um, thank you so much. A very stimulating presentation. And thank you for your time. We are now going to have the well-deserved break that you invited us to have. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. We will now have a short break. Um, and if we reconvene at 10 past 12, please. 10 past 12 is very short, mm. I know. So we can crack on with our case studies. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Stern tones of Kath bringing us back to order. Hope you've all had a chance to have a comfort break. Thank you so much to our keynote speakers. We've now got two case studies, specific examples addressing this question. And our first speaker is Andrew Mackay from Tully House Museum. Andrew, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to attend. Um, I'm director of Tully House Museum, um, and I'm going to say a little bit about our ambition in terms of um, our development plans. But I just wanted to start by talking a little bit about barriers, because we have talked a, a little bit about barriers. And I think you've got to address the barriers before you can explain the ambition. And in, in Cumbria, for me, there are obvious barriers, and there are perhaps some that are less obvious. So I think for me, Funding is a big one. We know that it's chronic underinvestment in arts and culture across the county. Um, geography has already been mentioned. You know, we've got big hills, we've got country lanes, so it's not easy to get around the county terribly well. Um, but perhaps the biggest is, is population. You know, there's half a million people living in Cumbria, and the tourist population is huge. Come on to that again in a moment. Um, I think there's also a couple of other barriers, though, that I just wanted to say a little bit about before I talk about Tully House, and they are the establishment and the attitude as well. And I think that chimes with what we've heard from Hazel this morning and, and from Janet and, you know, all the speakers. Um, and, and for me, by establishment, I mean um, central government, local government and organisations like Chamber of Trade and Commerce and even the LEP. They're all gatekeepers in a way to uh, allowing or encouraging or, you know, not their fault necessarily, but also inhibiting cultural development and ambition. And I think it's partly because they don't get culture. They don't understand what culture means and how it can add a sense of place and a sense of vitality and well-being and all the stuff that Hazel was talking about earlier. And again, I reiterate, it's not necessarily their fault. And I'm really pleased that an organization like the Cumbria LEP have um, tackled that head on. And they've created a, a creative and cultural sector panel. They've uh, they realized that culture plays a dominant role in the economy and is trying to do something about it. We need all of those organizations to do something about it. And, you know, again, Hazel mentioned Michael Gove and the forthcoming white paper and leveling up. And I'm going to say a little bit about maybe Tully House's um, experience of going through that leveling up process. So I think those organizations, you know, we have to help them to change. I don't know if anyone in the room, you know, has ever applied um, pre-COVID. There was a number of grants available through Chambers of Trade and, um, and, and Commerce, and they were at business support, business development grants. And we're a big organization of 40 people. I applied for that. I couldn't make head and a tail of what they were bloody asking for. And, you know, we put 
the funding bids in millions of pounds to all sorts of organizations. But the, the way that they're structured is not conducive to cultural organizations. And that's a huge, huge barrier. So we can't achieve stuff unless, you know, as Janet's saying, it's, a, it's about equity and those organizations need to change as well. So I think there's a very strong case to be made about Cumbria having a resident population of half a million, but a tourism population of over 40 million. And there's a huge, huge difference there. And I think that's the case that we should be making to government, to all these authorities and all these people about the infrastructure is there to support 500,000 not 40 million. And that's the that's a, a big point for me. And, and um, there's been there's been some criticism, I think, probably fair uh, criticism about Arts Council um, this morning. And um, I, I want to pay credit to Eden Arts uh, for these statistics. But it is interesting. And I'm just going to uh, reference some of the stuff that, that uh, Adrian Lockhead and his colleagues have done in looking at Arts Council investment around the country. And they've found out that Allerdale um, spends, Allerdale Council spends £13.83 pence per person in their district. Now that is partly because Theatre by the Lakes there and they do a fantastic job and they should be getting the Arts Council investment, but that skews it. So if you take Theatre by the Lakes out, that figure drops enormously. South Lakes, where we are now, £14.89 per person. You look at Newcastle, £37.49p. Manchester, £48.62p, that's per person. So this, you, you begin to see the problems that Cumbria is faced with there. It's a big challenge. So I think we need to make the case um, through all channels that we possibly can that healthy, vibrant places require three things, in, in my opinion, and I think this is well-founded. You need good housing. And again, that's an issue in, in Cumbria. You, you know, you're probably looking out the doors around here for houses that are two, three, four million quid. You go on the West Coast, they're 80,000, 90,000, huge difference again. Um, jobs. Um, we need a, a, a big organization to move here, I'm probably talking about Carlisle because of the infrastructure that Carlisle has in terms of road, rail, airplane now, and everything else. Um, but we need, a, we need a Google or a BBC or a, or a Channel 4. You look at Leeds, Channel 4 has made the decision to move there. That sparked enormous growth in that area. And in that, they've brought in people who are um, uh, from the IT side and they bring a lot of diversity and a lot of uh, inspiration and knowledge. And I was, I was really pleased that I'm from the Northeast, that Blythe, about two weeks ago, there was an announcement about the, a new factory there to build electric cars. And it was the uh, North of Tyne Authority and the local MP who fought for that, got government backing and did that. Why isn't Carlisle doing the same thing? Why are we bringing some big organizations there? Because that's what we need in terms of growing the, the, uh, the number of the population and the jobs associated with it. But the third thing is clearly culture. You need the culture you need a strong cultural offer to attract people and to keep them here as well. And um, I remember a few years ago having a conversation with, um, with Mike Osborne from um, Arab, who was doing some work in attracting talent to Sellafield, you know, well-paid scientists going to Sellafield. And they were struggling to get people to come because the cultural offer wasn't there, the housing offer wasn't there. And I, you know, I, I think it's the same case now. So we, we need to address all of these barriers by tackling this in a consistent way. Um, uh, and, and I think, you know, leveling up is, is one way in which we can do it. I just wanted to, um, to just give you some feedback. We submitted a leveling up application uh, last year and uh, we were unsuccessful and it was a big ask. We were asking for 17 million uh, and it was a single bid from Carlisle. Carlisle City Council supported us. So it's a lot of money. We put a huge amount of time and investment in it. It was to redevelop the museum, Tully House Museum. And uh, I've got the feedback that we got here. It says strong alignment. Carlisle is un underperforming. And this is a, our application made a strong case. It clearly aligns to local strategies and priorities, very clear and good. Positive alignment to net zero strategy. Inclusion was very good. Very strong value for money section, good analysis, calculations were correct. Monitoring evaluation, strong, procurement compliant. There's no negatives. Yeah, I didn't get any money whatsoever. So why is that? Why, why is Cumbria not getting its fair share? Barrow got some leveling up fund and fantastic for Barrow. I'm really pleased about that. But as a county, we've got to make the case even more. There's also those stronger communities fund. 
not one organization in Cumbria got stronger communities fund. So why is that? And is it, is it perhaps that we're not working strongly together to make the same case? We need to make a case and we need to be very focused on that case and we need to argue it very strongly. And um, I've certainly been bending the ear of my local MP, John Stevenson. He supported our leveling up application and lobbied very hard at central government. So we can only imagine that it's political reasoning. So on to, on to Tully House, because I know I haven't got much time. Um, we are um, uh, developing a major project. It's a, it's a capital project based on a, a master plan that we created in 2019. Before I go into what the project is, I just wanted to say a little bit about what I've tried to do in terms of leadership since taking the post at Tully House about five, six years ago now. I've been there 10 years, but only in charge for the last five or six. Um, we, we decided that we needed I'll use we all the time. We needed to work collaboratively as a team. Everyone needs to be on the same message within the organization. And we need to then roll that message out with our partners, with our stakeholders, with our funders. And uh, we identified that, that we have two priorities, um, community engagement and financial sustainability. Now those two are often in conflict with each other, but I believe they should support one another because the more engagement you do with communities, the more people will want to come to your organization, the more they come to your organization to buy a cup of tea or maybe a gift in the shop or pay admission, and that will help us become more sustainable. But that is a challenge because the two things can be conflicting sometimes. We are a museum, so museum collections have to be at the heart of everything we do. So in 2016, we created a manifesto that provides a roadmap that says, this is what we want Tully House to be. And we want Tully House to be the heart of the community, but we also want Tully House to be a flagship for Carlisle's cultural offer and to draw tourists into Carlisle. Because as the feedback I've just read out says, Carlisle is underperforming as a tourism destination and a cultural destination. So we want an investment in Tully House to try and, um, uh, to try and break that. We work very collaboratively. Um, Kate, Kate knows them in terms of leading the, the Cumbria Museum Consortium. Um, Michael, who's on the call, leads the Cumbria Museum Directors Group. So we try to work across the county as, as much as possible. There's a fantastic application gone into Arts Council about developing volunteers across the council, across the county. So it's all about working collaboratively to strengthen the offer across the county. So we're also very keen to invest in, in young talent as well um, and trying to encourage and develop young talent to make a difference for our organization. That brings an awful lot of energy to our organization. Um, it's been a very difficult five or six years because we've gone through several restructures. We've had to move people on. We've you know, had a huge amount of knowledge but by replacing them with young people with great energy, it's created a, a new dynamism within the organization. So, Project Tully, very briefly, is a capital program based on uh, about 15 year of development. Uh, we, this this um, master plan that we've created identify that it's gonna cost between 30 and 35 million pounds to do this. That's a huge sum of money for Cumbria, but it's about ambition. You know, we don't want to just have a new gallery for a few thousand quid or, you know, several new galleries for a few million quid. We think that it's really important to make a statement and to make the museum more sustainable in the future and give the people of Cumbria something to be really proud of. And Tully House is that and was that, uh, particularly in, in 2019, um, sorry, 1990, when the, the last major development was, um, was very successful. Cumbria is a much loved place. There's a, a lot of responsibility on me and the team not to destroy Tully House being what it is. So again, you need a lot of money to make sure you're retaining what people love, but also um, making it uh, fit and relevant for the, for the future. So in terms of uh, what we're doing, we're, we're making the building easier to navigate. We're gonna be putting more collections on display. We want to develop our audiences so that we can increase uh, visitors and users who want to work with us. Much more space for community work, much more space for schools. Contemporary art is something that um, we've, we've uh, had to reduce in recent years. We want to uh, build that up again. Uh, and ultimately it's about attracting uh, investment through secondary spend as well. And catering is very important to us. In fact, I could argue that the master plan is going to be delivered by changing the catering offer <laughs> so that we can attract different audiences because the audiences often come 
just for a cup of tea and coffee. And then they experience the cultural offer. So catering is, is hugely important. Um, we want greater uh, high street visibility as well. Um, and I'm pleased to say that despite the failure of the levelling up funding bid, we have just um, signed off uh, 4 million next stage development, which will be starting in April. And we've just, shouldn't be saying this because we haven't put the press release out uh, <laughs> yet, but we've also just secured 4.5 million from the lottery. So if we can get the match funding for that, we've got 10 million out of the 17 that we were looking for um, with, with uh, levelling up. So just to reiterate my last point about um, I think the lack of investment in Cumbria means a unified voice. And I would strongly say that it should be based on the fact that we've got half a million population, but we get 40 odd million visitors and we need that investment to help Cumbria deliver a stronger cultural offer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Huge thanks, Andrew. Um, uh, we've had a lot of quality contributions uh, and we've been very ambitious about how much we've packed into this meeting. So uh, we're not going to take questions just now, but we're about to go into breakout rooms where you'll get a chance to respond to all the points that Andrew's made. Um, and I'd like to thank Mari for her patience. Our next key, uh, case study is from Mari Bahan, who's from Common Purpose, and she's joining us on Zoom. Mm -hmm. I think she'll be filling our screens any moment now. <laughs> Are you there, Mari? I am. Lovely to hear you. And um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, I will try and be as concise as possible, but I've got to say it's been a real pleasure of being here this morning and just listening to the contributors, but also listening to some of the questions and seeing some of the questions and comments on our Zoom chat as well. I join you from Manchester, which I now know from Andrew is the recipient of huge arts council largesse. Yes. <laughs> But um, home home for me is actually rural County Fermanagh, which has got a lot more in common with um, Cumbria. Um, real pleasure to be here. Uh, mine's not so much a case study. Mine is actually telling you about an opportunity for young people in Cumbria, uh, which is all around raising ambition as well. And I'm really hoping that actually when you hear about it, you'll encourage your own young people to take part. Um, Many of you know about it because I've been talking to, we've been talking to Janet, to um, Saj from Multicultural Cumbria, to Andrew, to Kate, to various people about this already, but just let me tell you some more. Um, some of you may know Common Purpose. Um, for those of you who don't, we started out in the UK about 30 years ago in Newcastle, and we're all about cross-boundary leadership. It's all about recognizing that the world we live in is quite often, <laughs> chaotic, messy, complex. Um, and if, if, if as leaders, we are going to do anything to tackle some of the challenges we face, whether they're local challenges, whether they're challenges in Cumbria, in England, the UK, the world, we have got as leaders to be able to cross those boundaries. We've got to be able to connect, we've got to be able to understand difference, and we've got to be able to make change happen. So that's common purpose. But the big thing about Common Purpose in the last number of years has been the development of our legacy programs for young people. Those are programs for young people aged 18 to 25. We started in Singapore, then we moved to Chicago, and in 2020, we brought legacy to the UK. It's all about connecting young people, young people aged 18 to 25, investing in them. And my goodness, they need investment at the moment because whatever we may think, and we know that, you know, COVID has had a horrendous toll on many, many people. But I would argue that actually young people have had it harder than most in terms of disruption to education, disruption to employment, the impact on our mental health, et cetera. And I think we all need to think about actually how we invest in them, how we give them opportunities. So I think that's, you know, that's the, the critical thing for us. Um, what we do in our legacy programs, I mean, and the beauty of them at the moment, they take place on Zoom, so they can be Cumbria. It can involve all youngsters across Cumbria. It enables them to meet their peers, to connect with established leaders. And to give you an example, Julie Menel, the VC of the university, is one of our, is going to open the program for us. It will help them develop their leadership skills. You know, um, things around communication, around collaboration, around pro problem solving. Hazel talked about building confidence. Our legacy programs are designed to build confidence as well. And actually also they have a little bit of fun because uh, I think that's quite important as well. So they're very interactive, they're Zoom, but they're interactive, they're participative, they're not just listening to people, they're speaking, they're forming their own ideas, et cetera. And we also ask them to address a challenge for Cumbria. And in this case, it's the challenge we're using in all our legacy programs this year, which is a challenge about clean and green. 
you know, how do we transform our communities into clean and green communities for everyone? Building on COP26 last year, but something that's resonating with young people and resonating with established leaders as well. So that's at the heart of it all. And um, it's free of charge because we've got sponsorship from the County Council, Carlisle City Council, the University and from the Arts Council. And the Arts Council sponsorship is also providing those young people who are freelancers and creatives with an honorarium to actually cover any of the sort of their, their missed opportunity, their missed earning costs across, across a few days as well. Um, it was interesting, one of our people on our Sheffield program, a young woman called Sila Sabanda, um, she said the beauty for her of going on the legacy program was that opportunity to meet people who weren't like her. She's a spoken word poet. She's a DJ. She works on Radio Sheffield. But the thing about it for her about legacy was meeting young people who were working, who were studying, who were unemployed, who were campaigning, who were volunteering, who all cared about Sheffield, but actually people she would never come across in the normal course of events. Um, we can share the information with you. It takes place at the end of February, four days at the end of February, so we can share that information with you. Um, I was going to show a short video, but you know something? I'm going to send it out to you afterwards, because really, I think you've all been incredibly patient this morning, and you've all been I'm dying to sort of meet, interact, chat to each other, and I think probably the time to sort of listen to a video or look at a video is not now. So I'm going to really hand back and sort of be, hopefully you will engage with us. Hopefully you will actually see that there are young people in your organizations and in your networks that you want to invest in and actually take advantage of this opportunity. Um, and thank you so much for giving me the time. Thanks, Stefan. Thank you, and I do appreciate your speed. Um, <laughs> we, we will, if you do send us that link, we will have another opportunity on the CACM network to, to share the video. And if you can put links to the uh, initiative in chat, yeah. We're saving that on Zoom, yeah. we'll be able to look at it afterwards. Thank you so much. Right, well, thank, so, you, thank you so much. Um, we're now going to have a, a quick opportunity to express yourself in breakout rooms. We're going to do it this way. We're going to have three Zoom rooms and three in-person rooms. Um, for Zoom rooms, could I ask you to think about one, one answer to this question? <laughs> Lots to go at. It's an impossible ask. But what would your group prioritise as the number one thing to address this question? How do we drive up quality and ambition across Cumbria in the culture sector? It's a crude ask, but if you could go for that, that would be great. When you assemble in your Zoom room, would you mind just nominating someone just to just to take a few brief notes on the nature of the conversation and to, to note down what you all agree is, is the number one priority for your group? just under pressure. And then when we reconvene in uh, 15 minutes, we'll make this dead short, um, we can share those things before we conclude the meeting. So Amy's going to put those on Zoom into three Zoom rooms. Please find someone to note take and to take the answer to that question. And we will rejoin in quarter of an hour. Thank you. sounding like a great hubbub. Put your thumbs up if you can hear a hubbub. Yes. It's, 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 it's a real hubbub. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for being ambitious in, uh, in, in conducting those conversations in record time. We, we try and be kind to people and try and keep on time. It has been a bit over ambitious, but hey, that's good. Um, so could we have, first of all, could we finally have a contribution on Zoom? Um, I hope you did manage to give the black spot to someone uh, who will now feed back with some astounding summary of your discussion. Um, could you give us one of the groups, please, Amy? And um, who might it be? Who, who Just wave to us with your virtual hand if you were the nominated speaker, please. So we can have your conversation, your summary piped into... Um, in, in Just to say, in, uh, we had three rooms. So in room one uh, was Becca, Jane, Joe, Lorna, Maggie, Sarge, uh, and I think that was it, yeah. Fabulous. So from room one, who, who, who's got a feedback, please? Ever so briefly. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, I think the main thing, well, we had three key points. Um, one is talking actually about confidence that yes, we all recognize the, the quality and ambition 
uh, kind of points that we've been discussing today, but actually having the confidence to act now rather than just keeping the conversation going, to be able to collaborate and not compete. Um, and to actually, you know, as you say, try new things and not be afraid to, to, to fail. Um, so I think that was one of our key points. Um, the second one, I think, was picking up really on, on what Andrew was saying a bit earlier on, uh, that perhaps there is an opinion that residents of Cumbria are considered almost second class citizens. Um, we all understand that tourism is needed here in the county, but actually uh, a lot of investment from kind of... Uh, central and local government institutions potentially goes to support more of that that tourism infrastructure and there's much less investment for those of us that are actually local um kind of living uh, residing and working here in the county um and also thinking about the county itself so you know we talk so much about the lake district but actually cumbria is a, a lot more uh, disparate than that we have you know west cumbria we have real pockets of, of isolation of deprivation and there's this very skewed view of what the lakes is and actually does, does that help us in actually having a unified voice um, in actually coming together to say, no, this is what Cumbria needs. This is what we have kind of currently. This is where we feel we can actually uh, deliver something very exciting, but we need that support to do it for the, the county as a whole, not just in looking at the Lake District. Um, and kind of within that, uh, a feeling that there's very much a tiered approach in in, in kind of uh, applying for and securing funding. Um, if you look at kind of big organisations versus independent organisations versus individuals, there's a real divide in, in applying for funding and be able to first off having the time, headspace and ability, capacity to deal to apply for funding um, and that there's no help available. So perhaps for those, uh, you know, emerging um, kind of startup independent organizations young people perhaps starting their first CICs or independent artists um, they're always stuck in that same position because they're never going to have the same capacity um, and, un and understanding potentially to to apply for the bigger funds that more established organizations have that that ability to do so how can those conversations and support that people such as the arts cultural arts network uh, already do provide how can that continue um to help kind of even the playing field a little bit thank i think you. that was most of it yep. fantastic and thanks for a valiant effort in summarizing what must have been a very rich conversation <laughs> zoom room two could we find out who who's um, got a feedback briefly from there please i think that's jesse bins hello yes can you hear me yes that's great. So, yeah, we had uh, a really interesting discussion uh, and the main thing that came out of that was um, about connection and collaboration, um, really feeding from what a lot of our, our keynote speakers were talking about um, today, uh, that, uh, that question about how we connect across the county um, and also that challenge that Mari gave us of connecting to people who are not just like yourself um, and uh, also the question that, that Janet raised about uh, who is at the table designing the projects before we even apply for the funding, um, how, who gets involved in that process and how does that work. There was, uh, we talked about the, the importance of education and particularly uh, about how creativity should be seen as fundamental to, to education. Uh, not just in terms of uh, that kind of narrow definition of creativity, but also that that creative thinking, that creative mindset about how we approach things. Um, and we talked about uh, the challenge of equity and how uh, how we face the challenge, as many small organisations do, of making cultural experiences affordable in terms of a ticket price but also maintaining financial viability yourself and how that works um, so we talked a lot about how hard funding is to apply for and how difficult that that can be but what opportunities there are for us to join up to collaborate more to collaborate in new ways and particularly um, there was that uh, link that Derek mentioned with the LEP um, and how and what a, an amazing connection that has the potential to be. I think that's where we got to. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jesse. I'm going to invite Chris Bridgman. I think, were you chairing one of the rooms, Chris? Yeah. Uh, but if you could come to the, the, the hot seat, the, uh, 
yes. the mastermind chair, and ever so briefly, <laughs> if you could, it's, it's nice and warm. <laughs> Mm, okay. Um, right. Uh, picking up a lot of the points that have already been made, I think, um, about uh, confidence being crucial and certainly education, education, education. Um, and uh, I, I think we were talking particularly about empowering and funding individual artists, uh, but we also kind of honed in on the uh, confidence, not just of the practitioners, but confidence of the general population to engage with culture. And again, education being crucial in that. So from an early age, but I think also at any age, opening people's eyes to what culture is and can be. And the point was made that, you know, everybody consumes culture all the time, whether they know it or not. And they maybe think that it's something else other than what they are enjoying anyway. Um, so uh, yeah, I think crucially kind of investment in education and uh, confidence building, which then can lead on to a kind of grassroots support for artists and uh, uh, cultural activities. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. And my apologies for rushing people. Um, I'd like to invite Heather to come and feedback from one of our in-person rooms as well. We do. Thank you. Heather. There we go. Uh, hello. Yes. So we also uh, probably covered a lot of points that people already have. We talked about scale, um, large versus small, and the same processes they still have to go through to get funding. Um, we talked about uh, kind of a ladder to give um, to give people a platform to sort of build on, depending on where they are. We really liked uh, Lindsay's comments for raising ambitions, add to competitive solidarity, risk-taking, cost of failure, pay it forward, right to live well. And we talked about maybe that's something we could develop, not necessarily take them all as they were, but develop that as the Cumbria Arts and Culture Network as something then we could all use in funding bids. Um, and then really the, the nub of it, that connectivity, that working collaboratively. Thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> if we can have our last Zoom room, please, Zoom room three. Um, who would that be? Who's going to feedback for us, please? Uh, I think that might be me. Um, there, were, there were only two of us in the room, um, so <laughs> uh, it wasn't what, what you call a group discussion. Um, but I think it, just touching on a, a lot of the things people have already uh, raised, really, um, I think particularly around the curriculum and needing to, you know, start at the beginning there and make sure that um, cultural opportunity is embedded in the curriculum uh, and then thinking beyond education that um, actually those barriers that exist to young people uh, developing careers in the cultural sector in Cumbria, transport, um, you know, the up housing, all these kinds of things. So a holistic a holistic approach needs to be needs to be taken to this. Uh, um, but also we talked about honesty as well. I think that was the other the big thing that came out of our conversation really it was about um, as organizations and individuals being honest at both about uh, the stage we're at in terms of a lot of the, 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 the subjects that we had discussed this morning um, about having transparent conversations about, um, particularly from a museum side about our collections, you know, and what we should, what we should retain, what we should um, uh, display, uh, whose voices should be um, part of those uh, those displays, uh, not just the single curatorial voice, but actually giving others the opportunity uh, and a genuine opportunity as well, uh, and, 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 and empowering people genuinely rather than just paying lip service to it. Um, and also, you know, that opportunity which technology can can bring to to sort of um, engage a wider audience, particularly a younger audience. And we talked also about definitions of culture and whether we need to move away from um, perhaps our quite rigid definitions of culture and think more broadly um, and how technology can help us to do that. Thank you, Michael. Very clear. Thank you very much. Our, our final feedback will be from Tom from one of the in-person rooms here at Great Bay. And my apologies for running over slightly, but it's been such a rich meeting. Rich meeting indeed. Uh, so I'm going to boil it all down to this word inequity. So we had some great, broad, ambitious ideas. Let's have a let's have a Cumbria fringe. Let's have a Tate Carlisle. Um, but we should also improve the understanding of what art and artist is and does. That goes back to the education point, I think. 
but and also picking up from Michael, you know, you, you can make the stuff happen when you make stuff cheaper and better, like travel and housing. Um, Andrew raised the point of actually, you know, things changed in New York in the 80s when suddenly there was space, cheap space for artists to work in as well. But ultimately, I think all those things feed into inequity, the challenge of inequity. If we were to focus on the challenge of inequity, be that funding, be that representation, be that access, I think all these things have potential as ingredients to feed into that. But we'd have to really focus on that word inequity and what it means. Is that all right? Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, so much to go at. Um, there's a recording and the chat for everyone who may not have been able to make it today to, to, to look at beyond this. And to conclude, um, I'd like to invite Kath Hemsall to come and say a little bit about the Changing Culture programme before Kate Parry signs off. Thank you, Kath. <laughs> I'm just going to check whether I'm muting myself. Because <laughs> that would be a horrible way to end a technological failure. Um, welcome everybody from the other side of the camera and thank you so much for persisting with us in this hybrid format. It's been fantastic to feel the energy in the room, but my goodness, it's also been fantastic to feel that energy on Zoom as well. Um, thank you so much for taking your Saturday morning to be with us here today. Um, we are celebrating, if that's the right word, although I feel rather sad about it, the end of the Changing Culture Programme, a two-year ACE-funded uh, transforming leadership programme for aspiring leaders in the arts, uh, many of whom are here in the room today. This networking event was designed originally to launch them off into their careers, but I'm really pleased to say that most of them are already incredibly successful um, and doing very well for themselves. So I hope instead it will be a chance for them to have some fantastic conversations with the people of the Cumbria Arts and Culture Network and the speakers who joined us here today. I have heard today very much as a call to action, and I'm sure the participants in the Changing Culture Programme will have heard the same, to really get out there and actually do something as well as talking about it. And if that doing is collaboration, then the talking is important, but we actually need to do stuff and not just talk about it. So I'm gonna bastardize a little bit of Aristotle and finish by saying, <laughs> we are what we repeatedly do. Ambition then is not an act, but a habit. Thank you very much. And thank you to Stefan and Kate. I'm looking there. <laughs> I've just about got the hang of the technology after the last few hours. Uh, how far are we off one o'clock? A few minutes over. We apologise because we really do try to finish on time. Uh, I wanted to say, first of all, thank you to Stefan, who's coordinated all of this. I'm the chair, Stefan is vice chair, but I have just had a, so many other things to focus on just recently that Stefan has done all of it. And there were a number of times when I've rung him up and said, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> Half a dozen times I've said, are you really sure we can do this? I thought it was too ambitious in the circumstances, but here we are, we've done it. And I'm sorry that it's a few minutes over. Um, Amy is behind the scenes and as ever has been brilliant. So thank you, Amy. <laughs> Who I only met for the first time today. Um, and he's lovely. And I really hope that we can keep up a relationship with Kath uh, here at Brave Bay and to everybody who's made us feel welcome here. Um, what next? Because it's very easy for this to be a room full of hot air a Zoom room full of hot air and then go on and do nothing. I think it's about individual responsibility to think and listen and, and act, but it's also about organisational responsibility to go away and change. And as a network, we will take the many things that I've written, I've got pages and pages of notes and I've circled all the different barriers and the things that we might do about them. As a network, we will go away and the steering group will have a look and commit um, to you know a number of a number of actions I can't say what they are because it, you know it's a democratic process uh, and we will start that after this um, and so just to finish I wanted to say uh, I go back to the important point of champagne mm -hmm. because I, I don't actually drink champagne I drink Aldi Prosecco like <laughs> But it's, you know, it's an important point because, you know, what Janet is trying to say and has said to me is that, you know, I, I am coming from a, a, a position of white privilege. Um, and so, you know, my ambition is, is the sky's the limit in many ways, but 
you know, I am privileged, I am white, I am middle class, and that's okay. I, but I need to turn that into a position of responsibility. And responsibility to drive change is one of the reasons why I do what I do for the network and, uh, you know, in my day job. Um, so that's what I'm going to remind myself of. It's something that we talked about at the Anti-Racist Cumbria Summit, and that's what I'm going to take away from today. Um, as well as the fact that it's just been amazing to see people face to face, mm -hmm. most of you for the first time in two years. So hurrah to that and thank you, everybody. Goodbye.